Hey, this is Whitney Webb of The Last American Vagabond. Ryan and I decided to release the first half of my recent phone call with Maria Farmer with Maria Farmer's full permission. Maria is the first Jeffrey Epstein victim to report both Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell to the FBI, which she did back in 1996, and her sister Annie Farmer is also an Epstein victim. What follows is my conversation with Maria with as few edits as possible, and edits were only made when a statement was made off the record. For background purposes, this call was never recorded with the intention of airing it as an interview. It is very informal and is a bit disorganized in terms of topic, as I let Maria tell her story and any tangents or caveats as she remembered them. The intention behind Ryan and I deciding to release this phone call was being as transparent as possible regarding recent interviews and things I stated um, regarding my call with Maria, as well as helping this information reach the widest audience possible. The Last American Vagabond also plans to release the second half of this phone call at a later date. Without further ado, here is the first half of my conversation with Maria Farmer. Can you hear me? Whitney. Hi, Whitney. Hi, this is Whitney. Yeah. It's, fun. it's nice to connect. How Hi. are you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Hopefully you can oh, hear me. Oh, gosh. I, I, yeah, I've wanted to talk to you for ages. <laughs> <laughs> I really, like during all this stuff with Wexner, I've just been dying to talk to you because I just sort of have the scoop on them, you know? And no one, no one in the media is willing to talk about it. Yeah, like, well. No one I talk to about them ever tells. Well, I um, (laughs) am am a little different, as you know. Um, I've been willing to go there, but I've been really swamped, unfortunately. Um, Had a lot of other things come up after my Epstein series. You know? Oh, no. Yeah, and I had a bunch of other stuff going on. So my apologies in taking so long to to set up a call with you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, this stuff happens to to people and women all the time, you know? So I just... um, just to give you some background yeah. as to why I, um, you know, took so long because I, I have also been really interested in hearing what you have to say because, you know, um, I, a lot of my interest or not interest really, but focus on, on Epstein has been a lot of the stuff that happened, you know, in the nineties and even before then, because I think that hasn't gotten yeah. enough attention. And that's I think that's I where a lot of the you. real story is. Right. Exactly. And so, right. I know that, you know, <laughs> so. yeah, for some reason, yeah, for some reason, I mean, it really helps them to oppress all the truth, you know. So as much as they can with where it all began, they're going to keep it quiet, you know. And the FBI, Whitney, is so much an evil, I mean, I can't, I can't even explain to you how abusive the effing FBI is. It's unbelievable to me. I mean, they, first of all, never offered me witness protection. And when I first called them, they knew I was telling, believe me, they knew I was, what I they knew everything I was telling them. They already knew because they're in on it. And it was so weird, his reactions when I was talking to him, you know, I, I called and I got some answer guy and then he passes me to some guy who's like, when I start talking about Wexner, you know, and I asked the guy, do you have, this is all over the phone in 1996. I said, do you have a file on Les Wexner? And he said, why? And I said, he's the head of the snake in this, in America. And I don't even know I was intuiting this just, and also I think it's common sense when you see all the stuff going on. And anyway, when I said that to him, he said, oh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we do. And I said, well, he's a, he's, these people are, are using child pornography and they've stolen photographs of my sisters. That, that right there would have been life in prison for Jeffrey and Gillan. I still have the envelopes with their touch DNA and fingerprints on them, and the FBI will not take them from me. They never would. They would never take the envelopes that they stole. I mean, they photographs out of these envelopes, and I have proof. I still have the envelopes, Whitney. And the FBI was like, yeah, no, we don't, we don't need that. They also knew in 1996 that I had been trafficked and Annie had been trafficked, and that would have been enough to put them away. But they never cared. They didn't care. And the worst part was I named everybody. I named Donald Trump. I named everyone who I thought was a co-conspirator at the time. So I named like um, Alan Dershowitz, Donald Trump, uh, absolutely the Clintons. Um, You know, these are people that I saw coming and going that I knew were part of it. And I, I made it really clear that this is a very scary thing for children and that I see between five and 10 girls a day going upstairs. 
and now that I know what's happening to them, I want it stopped. And um, <clears throat> the weirdest part was, like at Wexner's, I was held under, I was held under guard. I wasn't even allowed. Can you hear me still? Yeah, totally. Hello? I just don't want to interrupt okay, you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're so sweet. Yeah, I was just, I was held under guard. So when I first got there, this guy um, named Randy Bowie was there to show me around. And I got there in a rider truck with someone who this is, is when an acquaintance, you, were you know, not even the, a great friend. This is mural at Wexner's Mansion? This is what you're talking about? Oh, yeah. So here's, okay. yeah, here's the other thing. I wasn't ever, I had, I had actually told him I had told Epstein because I was really grossed out by them, you know. I said, uh, just the way they behaved, they were so um, ostentatious and, like, nouveau riche, like, always buying things and all about things, especially Guylaine. And she would always scream at me. She was very verbally abusive. I have a lot to tell you about her, a lot. I know her very, very well. I would say Virginia and I are the only two that really know her, and I know her well. <laughs> you know, I lived around her for a year like lived in all of their houses with them. And so, oh my gosh, that woman is the most dang dangerous asset for Israel that you can even imagine. I mean, she is so dangerous. And she grew up with the royals. Like she showed me all the photo albums, but I'll get back to that. But anyway, just basically the Wexners held me. Where, okay, this guy, Randy Bowie, shows up and he says, oh, hey, you're going to really love it here. And he's like, and Abigail's going to call you in a minute and welcome you here. And she's really excited about it. So the deal was I had taken a project from this guy who's a director, um, James Brooks. He's a director of, like, a lot of films. I think he did The Simpsons. You know, he does a lot of stuff. And I liked a lot of his work. And he did the movie As Good As It Gets. And it was supposed to be a small project. It wasn't even going to be a big deal. And so he had asked Eric Fischel to do the paintings for the movie. And Eric Fischel said, you know what? I have someone that I'm too busy right now, but I know someone who would love that opportunity. And he handed it to me. And I talked to James, uh, James Brooks on the phone, and he said, okay, I'm going to take a look at your work, then we'll decide. He picked me. And then I said to Jeffrey and Gillen, I want to quit because I'm going to be, um, oh, sorry, I'm going to be going to, uh, you know, be doing these paintings for, for this movie. And they said, no, 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 you can't quit. You can't quit. This is what they did every time. I don't know why, but they were like, no, 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 you can't quit. And at this point, they'd already seen a picture of Annie, so that may be why, too. And they're like, okay, so you can just go and do this project at Wexner's because we've actually, you know, filed been meaning to send you there because Abigail said she wants an artist in residence. And Abigail can you Wexner, hear me still? You mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Abigail Wexner wanted a... Uh, wanted me as an artist in residence there is what Epstein and Maxwell told me. So anyway, when I get there, so I wasn't working on, I had no, I was doing no project for the Wexners. I never had even, I didn't care about them. You know, I wasn't impressed by them or anything and I didn't even want to go there. I did not want to go to Ohio, you know, but I did. I went to Ohio and the, when I got there, um, he was saying to me, you know, Randy was like, listen, you know, you'll go inside and take a call from Abigail. But don't come outside again unless you call her and get her permission. Now here I'm standing outside and it's really wow. beautiful with my little dog and I'm thinking and I'm thinking, wait, what? And my stomach just sank. And that was like the first clue. And so I talked to her and she was very phony, creepy, but you know, very like over the talking for like twenty minutes, congratulating me on the project, telling me so when this woman says she's never heard of me, I want to slap her because not only has she heard of me, she kept me captive in that house. I mean, I went out three months and no one ever talks about it. I was there for three months and, and, um, I was only allowed outside like four or five times the whole time I was there. And the other thing that the, the mainstream crappy lying media will never talk about, I guess because Wexner has such ownership of them. I think he's embarrassed of, like, the wealth or something because the house I lived in that was the guest house was 26,000 square feet, and I lived there by myself. Wow, that's big. That was the guest house. His house, yeah, his house, which was right behind it, and I can send you pictures. I mean, really close. Um, like, I have pictures of my brother on the back porch, and 
this was one of the times we were allowed out. And you can see their house very clearly from him. And you can see in an aerial view. It looks like a second, second set of arches. Anyway, it's the guest house. And it very much was owned by them, and, and it ha they had 330 acres that surrounded it, so you can't leave the house. But they're trying to say, we don't have anything to do with that house she was living in. Anyway, whatever. So I guess allegedly they had handed it over to Jeffrey for like a year. You know, they were always doing these really creepy money laundering things yeah, with, with, real, with estate. real estate. Yeah, I know. And it's... <laughs> I was going to do a whole series on that, yeah. actually, because yeah. I think that's where it's the so whole Epstein-Trump relationship is from, all the, you know, real estate and stuff in Manhattan um, that was going yes. on there. It was being passed yes. around to all these shady shell companies Absolutely. and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's so weird. So, anyway, the, the this house that I lived in, I mean, so while I'm there the whole time, I would call like a hundred times before I would get anyone on the phone and I'd have to ask, you know, I really want to go outside today. And the other part, you're not going to believe this, I had been told that I would be able to eat at this country club and, and stay there, uh, I mean, you know, go there and play tennis, and, and I don't really play tennis or anything, but I thought, oh, I'll learn how to play tennis. I'm in Ohio, why not? And so I never, I only got to go there twice and take a couple lessons I don't know if you know about Claire Hazel. Do you know about her? Uh, no, it doesn't ring a ring a bell. Okay, she's someone you really you really need to look into her because she's key a key co co conspirator that no one discusses. And Gilan got her married off to one of the um, to one of the what are they called the the Guinness family. So now she's Lady Claire, and you're not going to believe this, Whitney. You know the movie Eyes Wide Shut. It was filmed in Lady Claire's mansion uh, estate wow it says claire hazel yeah. is dead Remember, I... is that true i didn't oh no that's a different what person. no 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 it said it says obituary in cincinnati yeah, that ohio no that's not the same person then no no okay. this claire hazel um this claire hazel is british and she gilan brought her over she procured girls from england at least two and you can tell by the flight logs but it's really weird because she um, she was just a real creeper. And she was, like, asked to babysit me when I was in Ohio. But Jeffrey introduces her to me as his girlfriend. And he had already told me he was married to Gilliam. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is so confusing. You know, I had no idea what was happening. And, and I think they tried out a lot of stories on me and realized they didn't really fly, so they changed their stories with other people. But one of them definitely was that they were married. And then... Anyway, Claire was someone that was kept by Jeffrey, and she, she's gotten off just scot-free, you know, with all the crap she did for him. She now lives in that, in that mansion in England, and she's Lady Claire, and she's totally under the radar and protected by money. But that's what Glenn did, went to keep people quiet. Like, she got Sarah Kellen married up to that NASCAR driver. She married up Claire. I mean, there's a whole list of them, you can see, that she just found a way to get them a lot of money so that they would stay quiet. Uh, yeah. And they're all like Gilan friends. Yeah. That she introduced them to. But anyway, it, when I was supposed to be able to use this country club, I was able to go a couple times with Claire. And when I called Gilan and asked why I couldn't eat there, she said, it's a Jewish country club. You're not Jewish. They're not going to serve you. What? Okay. This is how, this is how this woman spoke to me. Yeah. This is how she, this is how these people think, Whitney. They, honest to God, think their DNA is better than everybody else's. I swear to you. It was a very, it was a theme all the time with them. With Eileen Guggenheim, with, um, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, with, with Guilan. It was a theme. You know, Jeffrey was a lot less horrible than Guilan as far as a human being. Like, just being around her. Because she was raping just as many children. Oh, but I she was the one it. with, like. The, she used, yeah, she used to be very smart, and now she's become like a decrepit intellect. I mean, she's not an intellect. She used to be an intellectual, I swear, and she was fascinating to talk to. And I don't know what she's consuming, but it's not helping her because she's just absolutely. I don't know if she's drunk, uh, drunk now or something, but she's not smart. I saw a lecture she gave at the UN, and it was just so dumbed down. It was not who I knew, you know. Maybe drugs or something. I have no hey, idea. Hey, wouldn't it surprise me, man? 
<laughs> uh, to be honest. I mean, someone like that, I know, um, I know. who knows what they get into, you know? So, um, yeah. anyway, so the country club, you weren't so, allowed to go yeah, because it, it, it never was enough. only for, um, you know, people of a certain religion Jewish and people. ethnicity. Okay, so... Yeah. Religious. That's unfortunate. Okay. So right. how long so were you at when this, I was um... at home? Oh, sorry, I... go ahead. Yeah, I was there for three months. Okay. And for the three months that I was there, the good thing is when I first got there, Gilan and Jeffrey made me get a driver's license because they wanted me to come pick them up. They visited like three or four times, you know. It was only the last time they assaulted me. Uh, but the first few times they visited, they were like with Claire and, you know, every time they were meeting with Wexner. And that's how I knew Wexner was there when I was assaulted and so was Abigail because they had just met with them that evening at the house and then walked back. And, um, but the whole time I was there, I was, I lost 20 pounds. I was very small anyway, but I lost 20 pounds because I wasn't allowed to go get food, even though I had this driver's license. And Jeffrey had given me his um, SUV to use while I was there. And, but I couldn't go outside because, Whitney, there were sharpshooters. And no one discusses this. Actual freaking sharpshooters everywhere. And I have a guy that I can connect with who was Claire Hazel's boyfriend, even though she was dating Jeffrey, who also witnessed the sharpshooters in the bushes. And Claire described it all to him. Because he, yeah, sure. Claire used I mean, to go there all the that time. Can help she called corroborate it, so. it because you know the the thing um, yeah. that I do is that you know there's a lot of people that have been trying to discredit a lot of the stuff I dug up on these people and the whole mega group crowd and all of that. So anything yeah. that can corroborate a little more, you know, the the more yeah. people you have that witness something, the less uh, people can try and poke holes in your story. You know what I mean? So any anyone you want to connect me to? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Pictures, any of that, um, feel free to send my way. But one thing I was going to tell, yeah. tell you once we finish, but I'll just tell it now. My email is changing. I'm not writing for okay. press anymore. So okay. I'll, I'll send you my email um, okay. here at the here at the end. And, and just send on um, whatever um, okay, you, you, you're willing to share, you know. Because I'm doing a book on this. So I, I have yes, tons, of, tons of space and a lot of oh, interest. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> So um, yeah, I definitely plan to That's put as much info in there um, as I can, because um, well, one th I, I don't want to interrupt That's your story too much, Whitney. but I wanted to talk about, uh, to you about your reactions to this new um, ruling. And yes, I, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. and I think it's really important. Yeah, and so I can do the other stuff later. No, tell I us, do too. I, I'd love it if you tell I do it too. to me First now. Of all, I have I have time, so don't don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. Great. So whatever well, you're, um, you're already I, telling let me, me just about really quickly this. Tell so you just my forward. reaction. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, okay. We'll go through this then. Okay. So <laughs> basically, um, <laughs> just basically, <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, this, this, but being at that house was the most dystopian, like horror. I know it's me. So I, I get, I, I'm very, very angry that they've gotten away with this, you know, because this guy, Randy Bowie is now Will Smith's bodyguard. Now, guess how I found this out? Jada Pickett Smith wanted to interview me when all this broke. So she calls me, and it's her, it's her manager or whatever is talking to me, but she's there. And Jada Pickett Smith is like, oh, tell us everything. And I'm like, well, you know, the thing that happened that made me sick was this guy named Randy Bowie. We just found out his name was the one who held me against my will for 12 hours, bruised me up, and threatened my life. And I was convinced I was going to be dead. Did he, and he physically she hit said, you? Uh, no, he held onto my arm. Ah. And I had bruises like you would not believe. Yeah. Oh, no, he physically restrained me. And this guy is so violent and huge. And he, what the thing I didn't tell you about him is when he introduced himself, right when I got to the estate, he said, hi, I'm Randy Bowie. I was special forces. I'm Les Wexner's right hand man. Okay. He introduced himself that way. He says in, okay, so Jada Pickett Smith, people, I never hear from them again. I'm like, that's really weird. So then I get this threat letter from Randy Bowie through Wexner's attorney saying, you liar, you blah, blah, blah. If you continue to defame, we're going to sue you. Of course they can't because I'm telling the truth and they know it. And I'm going to sue them to death if they, if they ever make any public statement about me, which I just wish they would. <laughs> Because I have all this medical stuff. I'm like, oh, I'd love to be able to pay for it, you know. 
Yeah. But, any, <laughs> but anyway, so Randy Bowie is such a scumbag. And in this letter, he's Will Smith's bodyguard, right? And he also protects, like, all these other, like, Hollywood elites, which really gives me the creeps that I almost interviewed with them, and they're part of the problem. Mm. And I didn't think they were part of the problem because I thought she fought with, um, I thought she fought the Weinstein thing, remember? Yeah. But I guess it's all just a big scam, you know? <laughs> I mean, they're all part, I guess if you're really successful in America, there's a reason why, you know? And you've, you've I think you've participated in it, you know? And anyway, the weirdest part about being at Wexner's was, I kept all my things, like my photographs and things, downstairs in this area that was below, like, the basement level. It wasn't the basement, because they had a basement. It was, like, below that, and there was a sauna in that room, like a huge sauna, and then they had, like, a vault, and then they had a door to an underground tunnel. And the only way I knew it was an underground tunnel was because their maid told me. I said, what is this door? Because I used to keep everything down there. And she said, oh, that's, that's t- the tunnel that leads to the main house. I'm like, well, that's weird. Why would they do that? And she said, oh, you don't know? And I said, no. And she said, there's a giant 10,000 square foot floor that raises up when someone goes through that tunnel. And then they can enter the room at secretly in, and then they, no one ever sees them. The floor raises up. She said, it's 10,000 square feet. Now, this is just the maid telling me. And she cleans it, so she really had no reason to not tell me the truth, you know? And um, she'd been working there a long time, and I asked her, have you ever met Les Wexner? And she said, no, I've been working here about 20 years. (laughs) Wow. She had never met him. I mean, here's the thing. I lived there for three months, and I never once saw him. I saw Abigail on her horses, you know, go out to get her horses. Um, you know, I could just see her and go out, but I never once saw him. And that's why I called him like the Wizard of Oz because he was controlling everything, but no one ever saw the guy. I mean, like nobody saw him except Randy Bowie was the only one who admitted to knowing him. But the other people that I would meet on the estate, they were like, no, we've never met him. We've never seen him. And Claire Hazel's boyfriend, I asked him and he said, no, I never saw him. He saw... Gilan calling Claire all the time, giving her orders. And then he also had, um, I'll let him tell you, but it was pretty interesting. He, he had some good insight. But anyway, basically, this downstairs where I would sauna and everything is where I kept the photographs. And the only way Gilan and Jeffrey knew that is they watched me on video all the time. So, oh, so one day I would go... House, so they were um, watching what you were doing? One day, oh, it was completely... Oh, oh yeah, God. it was completely, completely, um, it had the same pinhole cameras. Okay, so Wexner set up, just so you know, nobody talks about this, but Whitney, before that first house, uh, before the house on 70, is on 66, or 70 something, whatever, 71st Street, the house that Wexner gave to Jeffrey for a dollar, um, you yeah. know, it's like a, you know, the mansion that he raped all the yeah, children I in. Know. Before that house, there was another one. Yeah, Wexner gave him that one, and that thing was incredible. That's where Annie actually met him. I brought her over there. But that house, that mansion then was later given to Gilan recently. She sold it to give it to, or the townhouse, whatever, and that's how she settled with Virginia. She sold that. And I know because I was testifying for Virginia. Yeah, but anyway, she was like, I mean... Oh, my God, that woman. And she also had an apartment she took me to. And I walked in the first day, and it had one of my drawings on the wall. And I'm like, what are you doing with my drawing? It had been in my portfolio in my apartment in New York. And someone had gone in there and taken it out and framed it and hung it. She said, oh, I always liked that, so I took it. What? Wow. Like, how did you take it? It was in my apartment. I'm like, forget it. Just forget it, you know? And so then she shows me all this. Yes. So then she shows me all this stuff on the mantle, on the mantle, right? I, I can do, I could like, seriously, I have a photograph of that drawing. It is so weird that she had it. It's a torso of a male, it's like a Roman um, red, a drawing I did in red pencil. Anyway, so this, she takes me to the mantle. I'd never been in this apartment. It's on the Upper East Side. It was like probably 3,000 square feet, really nice apartment. 
Like, I didn't have any friends that lived that well, you know. But it wasn't, like, you know, showy like her other places. But she shows me on the mantle, and I'm like, oh, what's this? And she said, um, these are things my father took from the British Museum. <laughs> and she's like, they're ancient relics. And I'm like, did she? I'm like, she, did she just say that? See, I could never repeat things to people because they think I was lying or something. And I'm like, what do you mean he took them? And she's like, he took them. He liked them. And she's like, this is an ancient Peruvian relic. You know, and she's showing me this stuff that was 22 karat gold that had been taken from graves, but out of the British Museum. I'm like, well, this is not good. And then she showed me um, all the royals. Like, she had about, she had about like 12 photo albums of growing up with the royals. Everyone thinks that they met at um, Oxford. No, they did yeah, not. Yeah, I'm lying people. about that. Yeah. She showed me pictures. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, um, I talked yeah. about, I did an article um, where I brought up some scrubbed news reports talking about Ghislaine and, and Andrew way yeah. before they said they officially met. And um, I also heard from mm-hmm. someone that Epstein was in London a lot in the 80s and that he had met Prince Andrew at some point during his time in London oh, in the yeah. 80s. And he was oh, apparently yeah. dating Ghislaine in oh, the yeah. 80s, even though they claim they met in the early yeah. 90s and all this stuff. So I know they're all lying. Um, <laughs> so uh, trying to figure out like, right. how much they, they knew. I mean, any of that information is, is really helpful. So. Right. Yeah. Well, she also she also knew Fergie like a long, long time ago because I saw pictures of her super young with Fergie before she was ever married to Prince Andrew. Hmm. And I mean, it was weird. It's like they somehow she knew a lot of these people. Now she knew um, Prince Andrew when they were definitely like, I mean, she looked be maybe twenty in some of these pictures, hmm. or maybe younger than that even with Prince Andrew. Um, and so I can I can date some of it by telling you that some of the photographs where they're all super young, they were making fun. I'm not kidding you. The pictures of Diana when she was just dating the prince and um, D- Diana's in the corner crying in some of these pictures and Ghislaine's like look there we made her cry isn't that funny we hated Diana that's what she said and wow. I was like oh my god that's horrible yeah they were very mean to her like abusive to her and um, so yeah and they thought it was really funny wow, it's <laughs> but anyway oh, my little dog just came out to sun yeah, very, very sick. Very sick. Um, yeah, the things that brought Ghislaine pleasure were really weird. But I'm going to jump to something my mom said I should tell you because it's about Ghislaine, and I, I feel like it's important, too. When they had, you know, I had to go to Florida a few times, and um, I don't know why they would bring me. It was really weird. It's like they had to have people t- telling people what to do all the time around them. Not really Jeffrey, but Ghislaine. She needed servants around her all the time. So I guess she saw me as like a servant, you know, yeah. but she would also invite me to go shopping and she didn't have friends, obviously, you know? So they brought me to Florida and, um, on one of the, the first time I got there, you know, they showed me all around the house and there was this one room, there was something that I needed and she said, Oh, come with me. We'll go get it. And we went upstairs and she showed me this room and it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life, Whitney. I walk in, and there's like, like, how do I even explain this? It's like this place for your feet to hang on the wall, and then these leather straps to put around your calves, so you hang upside down. And then there were all these, like, devices everywhere. Okay, so I'm like, what is that? And I point to the wall, and she said, well, that's for yoga. I can hang upside down for 45 minutes like a bat. It keeps me really young. I was like, that's so weird. And I said, well, okay. what's this thing in the middle of the room? She said, oh, that's a sex swing, honey. She goes, that's a sex swing. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be sick, you know? <laughs> I thought, this is, I thought, man, the British are weird, you know? <laughs> she's, she's really like the first British woman I've ever known. Yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> so sure that's not representative of really British weird. people. <laughs> but, yeah, I can understand yeah, what they think It's that. not, it's not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because she's just so eccentric and British, you know. But anyway, so, yeah, no, they're not. But so um, the other weird thing about that house, which was very disturbing to me thinking about children going in now that I think about it, because you think about this, when I was going to that house, those little girls weren't even, they were in diapers, the ones that were raped in Florida. 
they weren't even born, and they were three. Like, Virginia was just a few years old when I was going down there. And, and everything that I told the FBI and that they knew to be factual, they ignored and then let all those little girls. So that's the part of it that I think has made me sick, you know, like have cancer. Other than Randy Bowie, I think it's that fact that they are not, um, that, the, that the FBI was in on it. And I honestly, after this experience, I think the FBI was created to protect these people. Well, the FBI historically I honestly um, God, has always they have... uh, run interference for organized crime. Like J. Edgar Hoover never pursued the mob, and Wexner's tied to that same mob that he okay. was covering up. You know what I mean? So, um, oh my God, yes, yeah. So it, it goes way back, pretty yes. much <laughs> to the beginning of the FBI. Okay. So yeah, well, I, could I mean, get, I took it personally. Yeah, that's definitely why. Yeah. So um, the other the other thing I was. I'm jumping around. I'm jumping around, but while we're on the subject of the FBI, I just want to explain the level of abuse I've endured. So basically, when I told them everything, I was on the phone for 45 minutes with my first report, right after talking to the NYPD. As we're getting off the phone, he says, don't tell anybody. Who wow. says that to someone? And not only that, I had asked, are you going to do anything to protect me or anything? And they said, no, 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 no. Okay, so then 10 years later, they come to me in North Carolina. And, and I'll tell you about this one woman, Nesbitt Kirkadall. I don't know if, you've, if you know anything about her, but she was a serious hero in this. She really, really wanted to get Epstein. And she was my agent. And now they think that she might be in witness protection because no one can get in touch with her, but she's still with the FBI. But no one can find her. And Brad um, Edwards, like every time he would find her house, they'd say she moved out in the middle of the night, like seven different times. So he's never been able to talk to her. Wow. But I've talked to her a few times, and, um, yeah, Nesbitt was amazing. She, she's like a superhero, Whitney. She, you, would, you would love her. She's brilliant, and she really, really, really cared, and she knew that children were being harmed, and it was <laughs> killing her because she has children. And she said, I, I tell you what, um, we're going to get him, Maria. I promise you. And she was just the coolest lady in the world. I believed her, and she believed it, right? And she was a champion for this. She had worked on it for years. So then when she came to me, I said, oh, God, is this about my student loans? <laughs> you know, the FBI's at my door. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and they thought that was really cute. And then they came in, and I was like, I don't know what to serve you guys. So I served them, like, cookies and orange juice. And they're like, Maria, no one serves the FBI anything. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Annie tried to sell them Arbon. It was like a pyramid scheme she was in. <laughs> but um, so anyway, but they, but after all this, like I asked, okay, so they wanted me to testify in Florida and Annie to testify in Florida, and they said we can't offer you, we can't offer any of the victims witness protection. What that's, is that? That's nuts. What is, what is that? That's criminal. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 And then Acosta made sure that everything was, you know, ruined. And I got a call from Nesbitt and she was crying and I didn't even understand what she said. And she was talking about they had, they'd lost and I didn't understand. So no one ever said, Hey, by the way, Epstein was, they let him off. <laughs> no one ever said that to Annie and I. So we were still waiting to testify until like five years ago. We're like, do you think we're going to go testify in Florida soon? Like, no one ever communicated with us, okay? So they, they swept Nesbitt away. Like, they took her off because they didn't want this solved, right? So they got rid of her on the case after all the years of work she dedicated herself to this. So they get rid of her, this genius, and then they settle with him. No one ever says anything to us. Then, stupid, um, but before all that, I was already in hiding because of Vanity Fair. Um. Vicki Ward is, I'm going to tell you right now, she's a monster. She's a true monster. She's not a hero. Uh, we had to send a cease and desist letter because she's harassed my family for so long to try to save her face because she told Ghislaine Maxwell over drinks that I reported them to the FBI. Can you believe that? Holy shit. And so oh, sorry, this was swear, in 2002. But wow. in 2000, no, please, I cursed my head off. 
I curse my head on. So sorry if I do. But <laughs> no, yeah, it's fine. I, I've it's been fine. through enough. I'm going to curse. Um, I, I noticed uh, <laughs> that she started following me on, on Twitter um, after my series, and I was like, hmm, that's yeah. interesting. I've cited some of her reports just because a lot of people yeah, sure don't, um, you know, uh, they don't really, um, well, I don't know. I thought I might get a hit piece or something. But sometimes I get people, mainstream people, following me, I guess, after the Epstein stuff. I guess they know I was seeing stuff. But yeah, yeah the, the pictures of Vicki Ward and, and Ghislaine have definitely gone yeah. around. I think a lot of people have seen them now. Um, but you you kind of have to rely yeah. on these mainstream sources I'll from back then. Because otherwise no one will believe um, believe you. I know. <laughs> Which sucks. But I know. Yeah. I know. It's so sad. Yeah. It's sad because, well, I was going to just tell you just a short thing on Vicky. She, for a year, promised us our safety for a whole year. And see, I didn't meet with Graydon. I met with Vicky. And so Vicky's the one that's responsible here because she was the person who promised us our safety. And she promised us that she would protect the story, right? Since then, she calls and threatens, I own your story. I can write your story. If I, I mean, she's a real, she's a real piece of work. Vicki Ward cares about one person, and that's Vicki Ward. She had CNN sending me hate mail and threat letters if I wouldn't interview with her. And so we had, my lawyers had to send CNN Ooh. and Vicki Ward a cease and desist wow. because of her hate. She was calling my mom, making her cry, like harassing my mother for years. We're not talking for like, but it was only when it was, when it was in style yeah, to I report just, on it. I just can't believe so all the she things tried that to make people herself like this. you have gone through. I just, oh my gosh, I just can't even imagine it's living so this. gross. It, it's oh, so gross. Wow. It's so gross when people like Vicki Ward try to get accolades, and they're really abusers. All I wanted to tell you about her, just because it's an important part of the story, is that my whole family interviewed with her, and it took us a year. Finally, my dad flies out. We all interview with her. We're sitting there. You know, we give her the story, and then she calls and says, and I give her three sources. No one ever admits that. Three sources, but they weren't just sources. They were billionaires and a famous artist. So two billionaires who don't want to lose anything, right? Very selfish people. They're billionaires, but they're willing to vouch for me. And they said, no, we'll absolutely vouch for Maria Farmer and Eric Fischel. And they all vouched for me. In my story, they knew because I had called them from the estate of Les Wexner. But here's the problem with Vicki Ward. Vicki Ward, she goes up to my lawyer in court and says, you know, um, I know it's awful what I've done to Maria, but, you know, I'm a kept woman, and I need to live in a certain style, and my boyfriend keeps me in my clothes in Bergdorf. So my lawyer's about to throw up on her. He's like, what is she, what is this, McGuck? what is she talking? Anyway, it ends up, she lived with Les Wexner's buddy, and I don't know what his name is, but he was Paula Zahn's wife, and very, he's a billionaire who was best friends with Les Wexner, and she lived with him for the last 20 years and um, in absolute comfort and luxury <laughs> while I was in hiding. So I'm like, wow. mm, I have a problem with her. Yeah, but, I can't um, blame so you. She, she told the pop, yeah, she told, she told, um, well, you'll see in this drawing that I did about them that I'm telling you, you and David Icke, seriously, the two of you, inspired this drawing. And it is, it's going to be on the Netflix documentary, and then Daily Beast is doing a... Uh, is doing a report on it, too, because it's just the coolest story. I don't know where it came from, Whitney. I don't know if it's because of radiation, <laughs> but I was like, man, that's the best thing I've ever made. <laughs> it is. It tells, I call it the diagram for the FBI, and it tells the whole story about these guys, and it's really powerful. Um, so I'm going to send you that after we talk. Okay, awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, sorry, I'm going to go outside because my dog is wanting to be out here. That's okay, I understand. I have two dogs. <laughs> um, let me know if you <laughs> so can hear. I, I know how it is. Oh, you do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to... Okay, I forgot what else I was telling you about them. There's so much. Anyway, I know there's just the so Vicky much. Ward thing, the only reason I was telling you is that she does... Yeah. Um, it was just really weird because she's, she considers herself an elite. Yeah, and I've she noticed that. Makes it very clear, I, I've like, seen that a little like, bit. I yeah. yeah. I mean, so yeah. many of these big journalists are, are in it but for anyway. the ego, and that's even true in independent media, too. Like, you know, small, alternative, independent media outlets. Yes, it is. I see it all the time, uh, no matter the size of their it's platform. True. Yeah, it, yeah. It's an unfortunate profession.
Um, but really quick, um, well, in that sense, you know, that it attracts a lot of people that are interested in, in you know, their brand and yeah. ego and not interested in the information. If it's okay with you, I'm going to send a message to my boss really quick um, so I can um, leave open. Oh, yeah. um, I was supposed to turn in something, but he knew that I was going to interview you. So I'm just going to tell him really quick, oh, if you don't mind, oh that I'm just going to okay. stay on with you for as long as you want to oh, talk no. today, if that's okay. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. So just give me a sec to write that off. Uh, if you want to um, keep talking, though, feel sure, free. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, I'm good at talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, me too. I was I'm meant pretty to do chatty, this thing. so <laughs> I, I understand. No worries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's funny because I don't know why Jeffrey and Gillen would have, like, done all this around me. I, I have my nickname, the Artistic Whistleblower. <laughs> So I gave myself because I'm like I didn't keep it quiet. That's for sure. Yeah, but, well, I, mean, um, I, I really appreciate though, your you... um, your you know bravery and willingness to speak up about this. Being a whistleblower, whether it's something like this or like you know people that used to be in government that speak out, it's hard. You know, it's like emotionally really taxing yeah. and requires yeah. a lot of yeah. a lot of guts. You is. know, so I think not enough uh, enough people don't not enough people realize yeah. that but i just want to let you know that i just i think it's incredible and i really oh um, thank you as much information as you give me i will put in the book you know what i mean oh that's awesome yeah so well one thing i wanted to say about um i was telling you about at wexner's too and i can't remember oh i used to it was so creepy because abigail wouldn't give me permission to go outside so i would go jogging in the house and so I knew the house really well, but I never went into Epstein's room because Ghislaine said you can't go in there. But I was talking to you about the, the cameras. And so mm -hmm. the there were little pinhole cameras in that first mansion that Annie met Jeffrey in. And in the second mansion that he gave Jeffrey for a dollar, they were in the building that his brother owned on 66th Street. The, the apartment there were pinhole building? cameras in all these buildings that Wexner... Yes. Okay. All yeah. the buildings that Wexner had owned. Well, oh, here's here's where they were in in the building that Wexner owned. They were in the Victoria's Secret stalls. And the way I know that, okay, so the flagship store was in that building on 66th, and across the street was Jeffrey Steen's office. He had his offices in the Helmsley Palace Hotel in the front, and they were all on the top floor. And I could, like, show you a picture of it if you want but sure. like exactly where his offices were yeah but yeah i'll send you that um but i mean i'll just get it offline and show you which one well I'd be, but i i really he, need to piece together yeah, as much as possible so, what they were doing in new york in the 90s because there's so little information about it i came across some articles yeah. that have since been scrubbed talking about galane's offices that she was running all these weird businesses in manhattan but i mean it's very little information just references to it and i'm not you know how am I going to find right. out the names of those companies and stuff, you know? So I, I really have a ton of um, digging to do. But anything right, you can right. give me on this stuff is is great. Okay, yeah. I didn't know Guilin had um, offices then. Because when I was with them, by 1995, they were full-time. She was full-time what she called the lady of the house. And she was full-time getting children for him. Full-time. I mean full-time. And the other person who was always going around with her, this is really weird, Donald Trump's ex-wife, Ivana, mm -hmm. was always in the car with her. I mean, constantly. No one, not one news organization will mention that. I want Ivana Trump to explain herself. That big old cow. Explain yourself. Why were you going out acquiring children with this woman? Because they'd come back and there'd be a pile of kids. So what's the plan? I mean, what's the deal here? Wow. <laughs> and that woman is awful. That Ivana Trump. She was, anyway, she was in the, they would go, what would happen is she'd say, I'm going out with Ivana, and she would say, you know, Maria, come along, and I would ride in the limo, and the driver knew what they were doing. He was this Hispanic guy. He knew all the, he knew very well what was happening, and I don't know his name, but she, we would go in the limo, and she'd be chatting with Ivana, and then she'd go, oh, wait, hold on, I see someone, and she'd run out and, like, talk to a child and exchange information with them. And then come back, and then that child would be like the next day at the house. Wow. And and I would say, "What are you doing?" She said, "I'm scouting, scouting for Victoria's Secret models." 
And these were like kids who had just gotten out of class, so they had their uniforms on. How old always. were they, would you say? I mean, it was very rare that they, uh, 12, 13. Right, okay. 14 maybe at the oldest. Yeah. Like braces age, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And I would say to her, I would say to her, like, why are Victoria's Secret? I asked her about 10 times because I have OCD. <laughs> And if I don't understand something, I'll just keep asking it. And so I would say to her, why are the children, why are their children modeling for Victoria's Secret? They don't even have breasts, you know? And she's like, oh, no, um, we need, need new vials for Victoria's Secret. We need new, that was the word she used constantly, new vial, new vial, new vial. And I admit that I didn't know what it was. So I looked it up and I was like, that's kind of gross. Like, why do they have to just have started their period to model, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyway, oh, oh really disturbing. Yeah. Whitney, I got to I've got to tell you something. This is why I've been dying to tell you. There are only 30 women that have come forward. 30. Whitney, I saw between I'm not kidding. I'm I'm very disturbed by this part. I saw at least five girls come in that house a day. I mean, no, on I, a I know really it was slow day there would be three I, little I girls. I know it was really high the actual amount. Oh, Whitney, it's in the it's in the thousand Where are they? Where are they? Are they dead? I mean, these children have to be dead because here's the thing. Like, Brad was like, what if they be drug addict? What? You you think some of them were killed? I I think that they had to be because here's the thing, Whitney. Brad said he knows of 500 just in Florida. Like, we can't find them. Where are they? And the thing is, like, oh, this kid's making that is loud machine out there. Um, Come inside for a second, Brady. Um, anyway, all I was going to say is that th- these children were between, you know, uh, yeah, thousands, thousands. I was there a year, and I saw thousands of little girls, which is, it was so exhausting, Whitney. They were in his offices. They were in, there were just constantly little girls there, constantly. And I remember one, one of the reasons I quit, I said, I am tired of dealing with the, the, the number of people coming and going. You know, I'm just tired of, and that sounds horrible now, but I didn't understand what was happening entirely. I just knew it was weird. And I certainly didn't know it was pedophilia. I mean, and the other thing is, Gilan had said one day in Florida, when I was in Florida, she said, you know, we have to go on a, a jog for a while. And I said, why? And she said, well, Jeffrey needs three massages. So while I was in Florida, there were three little girls being assaulted. And now I look back on that. I'm so creeped out. You know, I didn't know. But I knew that they abused their maids from the Philippines. Um, and that was another reason I quit. Uh, because one day I went to take a nap upstairs in the 66, or the, in the mansion on 71st. And, you know, I worked the door, like, signing people in. And there was no one coming in that day. And so I went and uh, took a nap. And w- they were the sweetest ladies from the Philippines ever and they came in and they were like kind of tucking me in and one of them whispered we I said I said um how long have you worked here and she said we were stolen I'm like what does that mean they were stolen they were trafficked and they had them and they had women from the Philippines in Florida and and in um New York and in the uh house on um in in, in the ranch and, they, and no one ever cares. Like, I mentioned this, and everybody goes, yeah, well. They traffic people out of the Philippines and Thailand as servants. It's, like, mm. so sick. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, that's where Virginia it's escaped, so right? Going sick. to Thailand to try and pick well. up some, some girls there for, for these guys, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Stolen. Yeah. That is see, they sent sad. Annie there on an actual program. <sighs> yeah, we were stolen. Oh, my God. I've never, it's, what you know, no wonder I only have, I can't believe I only have two kinds of cancer. I mean, seriously, the things I've heard. But the worst part of it all was just um, being at Wexner's. And for me, the very worst part was when, after I was assaulted, I called, I called a bunch of people. I called everyone I knew. I called Ian Guggenheim. She was the dean of students of my graduate school. And I told her what happened. And she said, I said, I think Annie might be dead. This is horrible. I thought my sister had been murdered. And they, and she said, well, you must have done something wrong. 
What? Oh, my gosh. That's what Eileen Guggen, I hope you make that quote in your book. She said, well, you must have really done something wrong. That woman hung up on me after that. And the only time I saw her after that was, so, so I'd just gotten out of graduate school, you know, the dean. She's still, she's still the president of the board. The year before that, Eileen Guggenheim called me and said, hey, Maria, um, I need you to go to move to London. I was at, visiting my family at home in Arizona. She goes, I need you to move to London and go to a, uh, go to live with Cy Twombly. You're going to be his lover. So he's going to call you right now. I didn't even get a word out. I had a boyfriend, Whitney. I'm like, what is going on? And I'm, I'm not like a loose person. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's so strange. So this man calls me. He's dead now. But he calls me from London, this weirdo, and he's like, so Eileen Guggenheim told me that you would be willing to come here and you'll be my life partner. And I'm like, no, I will not. <laughs> I mean, I hung up on the man. He's like a famous, he was, he's a very famous artist. I don't know. I'd never heard of him. But she, I, I looked him up afterwards, and I was like, God, that is the creepiest thing I've ever heard. She's a pimp. She tried to pimp me to a man named David Schaefer. She tried to pimp me to, have you heard of John Paulson, AP? Mm. John Paulson, he's a billionaire. Sounds familiar. Uh, he created the financial crisis with, ah. with, uh, yeah, yeah. he was the 2008, he's the one who, he's the only one who benefited. During, he and Alan Greenspan were buddies, you know. But JP was a good friend of mine, and I met him through Eileen because she tried to push him on me, but instead he helped me start a company, and he was actually very honorable. But then I found out he created the financial crisis. I'm like, oh, crap, he's not that great. But that was like my one nice acquaintance at the academy. But she tried to pimp me to all these people while I was a student, so here's the thing. There's a guy that, and I'm only telling you this very quickly because it just is so disturbing. She sent me, there was a Halloween party the first night at the New York Academy, um, first year I was there. And she said, hey, will you go across the street and get Christian Vincent? He's an artist that lives across the street. And I'm like, okay. She said, we can't reach him. Go over there and get him. And I, we had been to his apartment before because Eileen had taken me there to see his art. So I ring the doorbell and he was waiting for me. And he tried to rape me, Whitney. He shoved me onto the sofa and suffocated my face with his mouth. And he had like 17 locks on his door. And luckily he got a call. And I disassembled some of these locks. Anyway, they're official all about this the next day. And they fired the woman who sent me over there. But Eileen was never held accountable. She's just unscathed by all of it. And I, the reason I worked for Jeffrey Epstein at all was because Eileen's sitter is married to Bert Fields, who had, I had worked for Eileen's sister, and she was abusing me. I mean, like, literally abusing me, Whitney. It sounds so embarrassing that I put up with this, but I needed money so badly. And it was my first week out of grad school, and, she, and Eileen said, my sister needs help moving. So I went there, and I did all of her, like, cleaning her toilets, packing her things moving, while she laid around on the phone complaining about her millions, literally. Like, Bert only made $4 million this year. We're going to starve. And I'm lying there, sitting there cleaning. And then she flipped out on me because I went to go get some watermelon from the deli, and I was eating it in an empty room. And Bert walked in when she was verbally assaulting me. Like, I've never, other than Gilan, I've never been spoken to. Like, I mean, like, blood-curdling screaming. And so Bert walked me out, and he said, you don't need to deal with that bitch. That was his wife. And he's a very famous lawyer. So I walk home. He doesn't even give me the money. And she paid me with bad expired traveler's checks. He doesn't even give me the money for a cab. I walk back home to Greenwich Village. Literally, as I'm walking in the door, the phone's ringing, and it's Jeffrey Epstein. And he's like, I heard you work for that bitch Barbara. I'm get, you're going to have a real job tomorrow, Maria. So, like, they're all in on it together. And it's really, um, it was the most, I, I'm trying to change, I'm going to testify in front of Congress. David Boyes is going to make that happen. And I'm going to change some statutes in New York, and I'm going to go after these people, Whitney. I'm going to start suing left and right. I mean, it's insane what they did. Right. Well, power to you. Anything it's I can insane. help, let me know. And it's all... Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was going to tell you, too, that that woman, um, when I... Yeah, I'm definitely, before I testify, I'm going to want to get some information from you of things that I need to talk about because <laughs> I'm definitely going to talk about the FBI. I am so horrified by the way I've been treated. But the worst part about the FBI is that recently 
I was being, I, I was almost assaulted in Kentucky because this woman said that's said something about the Epstein thing. And another girl said, that's the woman who's claiming it happened. It was really weird. It was in a doctor's office. And I had to run out. And the people, this is in this really backward area, right? And people are so ignorant. And I don't know if they thought like I, they, that I didn't tell early enough or something about the children. But anyway, they were like, this has happened to me where people get really mad at me. They're like, you were there a whole year. Why didn't you say something? What they don't realize is, is I'm the only person who ever reported them. Ever. Yeah, you were the first And I didn't just go, like, there's a girl who doesn't, there's a girl, yeah, there's a girl who doesn't wear her pants, who, like, in L.A., who says she reported them. She went to, she tried to do a sting with Epstein to get some money, and she's convoluting the whole thing, and it really bothers me, because she's, like, my age, and she's, she's a totally disgusting individual who changes her story constantly. And I know one thing, when you've experienced trauma, your story doesn't change. You remember it very well. I mean, I could do it. I did an illustration of my story, you know, but anyway, this girl, I can't even remember her name right now, but ABC had her on the week after I was on and she told my story. She's like, if the FBI had only listened to me, she never went to the FBI. And I know that for a fact because I asked them, has anyone else reported Epstein? And Nesbitt said, no one, Maria. That's why you're so important. You're it. You're it. And Berman, who's in charge of the Southern District, is the most ominous character. He is so awful. I, I just, I don't even have words. Why do he you knows think he that I know a lot of stuff. Epstein re-arrested and he knew last that I had year. To... Do you have any insight into why the timing of that arrest last year? Well, yeah, I do. I do. I do have that. I have the perfect explanation for that. The NYPD, SVU cold case was arresting him and they came here two weeks before he was arrested to interview me to get it solidified so I knew he was going to be arrested and Annie knew but no one else in the world knew yep and we weren't sure they would find him but yeah they they went they went for the arrest and the and so the FBI took it over out of uh they had to They had to take it over. And it was Detective Phelan who was pushing for this. P-H-A-L-E-N. He's, he's, oh my God, he's like a freaking superhero. Let me tell you, NYPD is amazing. Those guys, they're the real deal. And uh, this Detective Phelan, they don't, they don't let a lot slip. And um, yeah, he was the one who pushed for the arrest. They weren't going to let it lie any longer. And then, and then, of course, the FBI goes in, sweeps in and takes the credit. But it was NYPD doing all the work. Wow. Yep. Uh, but do you and know, they don't get any credit so, ever. It's so, so you, gross. You think and they I were called, interested I called in, the, in arresting okay. uh, him last year because they just wanted to take him down after several years? Do you think there was any um, other motive behind that? Because I know that Deutsche Bank kept um, accounts. No open with him yeah. right up before maybe just two weeks before the arrest. And I thought that was kind of odd. Right. And that there might be some other thing. Going Very on. odd. Mm-hmm. Well, here's what happened. This, yeah. The thing that happened is the statue changed. And as soon as the statues changed, they had, you know, um, all these children that had tested, you know, had, had explained what had happened and they had gone to NYPD and they had gone to, or NYPD had found them and interviewed them. It happened. And so anyway, because those, as soon as those statutes changed, that's when I filed my affidavit because I was helping Virginia, um, to back her up because all these scumbags are saying she's lying and she's not lying. She's telling the truth. And so I needed to back her up. And, um, so David Boyce called and said, the statutes have changed. Now's the time. Because I had met with David three years before in Florida. And we were talking about when we were going to bring this public, you know. So this has been in the works file. But he said, now we can do it because the statutes have changed and we can go after him. And so that's why I filed my affidavit. And because of that affidavit and because of my initial report, NYPD came here to solidify everything before the arrest. Yeah. And they, I guess, you know, they, they had to all the women, they had talked to all the women who are now women, but they were children at the time. And one of, there was one girl who had just such a solid case that they were able to hand that to FBI to say, okay, follow this. 
but you know, the FBI has done nothing with it. And obvi- and I, I can tell you right now, 100%, Whitney, I knew that man, I knew that man, I knew that man, he would have never in a trillion years taken his own life. And I also know he was an asset. And he's the kind of person, what, Epstein said this to me one time. He pulled me aside, and I mean, I spent, all, I spent a lot of time around them, you know, so I observed them, and he was, he was a total, like, he was the opposite of man. He was someone who really enjoyed, like, game playing and, like, making people laugh and surprising people, like, shocking people a lot. But, so he would say really weird things. But one day he pulled me aside and he said, Maria, look at this. You see all this? And I'm like, what? And he said, this room, all these decorators coming and going and all this stuff being, all this artwork and this beautiful furniture. You see it all? I said, yeah. And he said, I got it for a dollar. <laughs> And I was so pissed. I'm like, a dollar? I paid 500 a month in Greenwich Village. I thought that was a great deal. How did you get this for a dollar? And this is the first time I heard the name Les Wexner. He said, Wexner gave it all to me. He'll do anything for me. Yep. And he had this big smile on his face. Why do you and, think and Wexner I said, would wow, do anything for him? Kind of him. incredible. And he said, Did yeah. he tell you about his relationship with Wexner, what it was like? Did he, like, elaborate any on that? No. And on that, at that moment, no. He did later talk about Wexner. Like, he said he was his only client. Um, when, when we were, okay, when I was at Wexner's, I was like, you know, this is the weirdest place. And Jeffrey, it's weird because there was a reason why he was able to be around all these people. He was very charming. But here's the thing about him, Whitney, and this is the thing that makes me so angry more than any of it. He was a sicko, like sick. He had a mental illness. He was a true pedophile. And all these people knew that, all these adults. It took a year to figure it out, okay? It took the photos of my sisters being stolen. Because even me being molested, it's like, well, I'm an adult, right? But it's sick. But finding out that those children, oh, damn. I mean, these pictures, it's very, it's why I stopped painting for 20 years. Because I was painting from images, and it just was so upsetting to me that I couldn't even pick up a brush for 20 years. And I actually gave the paintings I did there recently this year. I sent them to Eric Fischel. I was like, you can have these. He always wanted to buy them. And I was like, you know what? They're so disturbing to me. You can just have them. And you'll keep them in your private collection. And he was like, these are incredible. Those are the ones I did for the movie, you know? But I just couldn't even look at the paintings, Whitney. It was so disturbing. But anyway, basically that... um, yeah, he didn't tell me more about Wexner at the time. He did when I was in, when I was asking him why everything was so weird. He said, "Yes, uh, he said um, that you know when people have a lot of money, sometimes they become very eccentric." And but he always liked to say, basically, he just indicated that Wexner, like he had Wexner wrapped around his pinky, and I think he knew something on Wexner. And I also think Wexner is gay. And I'm not giving Wexner any excuses here. A lot of people But I think say that, that Wexner had a crush on Jeffrey. Yeah, and the reason I think this is because Jeffrey indicated that to me. Um, he, just by not even saying it one day, I said, well, gosh, I mean, this man, you know, he's so generous and he's your only client. And he said, Maria, he adores me. He'll do anything for me. Trust me. The man will do whatever I want. You know, he kept saying stuff like that. So that's usually like more of a lover relationship than a, you know, Mm -hmm. like what kind of employee will do anything you want? Employer will give you whatever you want. No, none of them. So it just seems strange to me. But I was like super innocent and pure kind of knowing this whole thing happened to me. So it makes me angry when people are like, um, oh, well, she was an adult, so it doesn't really matter. And. You know, that's actually not true. That's why I'm going to change the, change the statutes because some of my friends through this that were assaulted, he only really, really nice, wonderful, and very intelligent young women, Whitney. That's what's upsetting. I mean, straight-A students. That was the other thing. Yulan would interview. Okay, so well, I was telling you about her house. I know I'm jumping all over the place. Pardon? They, they yeah, the about brain, because ah. they were going to procreate with these children. Oh, uh-huh. You think yeah. this was this whole because, master race um, thing yeah, in Jeffrey. New Mexico that he was trying to do? Yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. 
they were gonna they told me Gilan called me at one point and said Billy effed up and I was like why what are you talking about you know I didn't want to talk to her I was hiding from her basically I was still in New York but she said um she said Maria Annie was going to give Jeffrey his children you are so stupid and I'm like that is the grossest thing I've ever heard it I never my sister was 16 at the time when she's saying this to me that's the grossest thing I've ever heard in my life <laughs> yeah she you I know mean, she would call me it, it, and I would change my number sick, and then and she'd call me my again sister, you know? oh man oh yeah isn't it sickening yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's really gross we're lucky because they were just grooming her still you know we're lucky we got out and and um it's we're not unscathed but we're lucky because i okay the plan for me in and they were definitely going to kill uh, randy bowie was ordered to kill me and i know that for a fact um you know what because of when he came to get me the look in his eyes i've, I've never seen a man look i've never seen that look before oh my God. and he was so furious and he said he said you have really screwed up and you are never leaving and I said, what are you talking about? Like, you know, here we are in America. And, and the worst part was, Whitney, I had just called 911 and they hung up on me. And I called again and the girl said, listen, the sheriff is at the gate. You're not getting out of there. And she hung up on me. Oh, my gosh. That's 911. Oh That's the New gosh. Albany Sheriff's Department. He owns, <sighs> he owns the whole sheriff's department. They work at his gate in the off hours. So the other thing is there were Dobermans. So I did get to see the Dobermans. And I, no one's going to tell me they aren't Dobermans. I know dogs. I'm a dog person. One day um, I went outside and without asking first, and a pack of Dobermans came towards the door, like flying. I, I went, got inside. I had a Yorkshire Terrier, and they would have eaten me alive. And I'm not afraid of dogs at all, but these dogs are trained to kill. And so I didn't go back outside for like a month. And I had my little brothers there. So... They had to play inside with me. They were just little bitty. And I just babysat them every summer, so they were there with me. And, uh, yeah, they just sat inside and ate candy and watched movies. <laughs> there was nothing to do, you know. And um, we weren't allowed outside. It's just the weirdest thing I've ever heard of. And I get mad. I get, like, jealous of people like Claire that she was allowed outside. Um, you know, and she was allowed to come and go. And even Virginia was allowed to come and go. And I'm like, why was I kidnapped? and not allowed to come and go like I'm jealous of the people who had freedom within their kidnapping it's so sad it's like it's so gross but um yeah it was the 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 thing that happened at at Wexner's was so abusive it definitely I could feel my brain chemistry change when Randy Bowie I'm not kidding you like when that doctor last year said you have a brain tumor I said how long do you think it's been growing and he said over 20 years and I knew exactly I knew when it started I knew it was when Randy Bowie threatened my life because, you know, when you feel everything like drained your feet, this yeah. was beyond that. It was like this weird feeling of, oh my God, I'm dying now. And he assured me several times that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I was never leaving the estate. And the only reason I got to leave is I literally called from that estate. I called every person I've ever met ever and screamed that I was going to be murdered on that estate. And I, held, I did something that I had seen on Oprah where he, she said, don't ever let them take you to the second location. That's where they're going to kill you. And so I stayed with my arms wrapped around the post of that freaking house for 12 hours. I would not let that guy take me. And I mean, I kicked and screamed and I made a scene. And he would pace around the truck because I have a truck there. And he would just pace and pace and pace and pace. And come, he's like a wild, he's a very dangerous man. Oh, my god! Very dangerous. And when he sent my threat, when he sent the threat letter to me about speaking about this, he said, if I ever speak about it again, I'll be sued. And of course, I've spoken about it to every news organization. And they check, and then they never, ever report on it, right? But he knows I'm speaking about it. So he's taken all of his information offline. But his excuse was, Our, my client Randy Bowie couldn't have done this. We'd like to know the day and the moment your client claims this. It couldn't have happened. He now has a wife and child. Wait, what? How's that an argument? <laughs> Am I missing something? <laughs> wow. So after so, what you went through, do you think... So he's Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith. 
bodyguard now, you said. But um, something I want to ask you really quick. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. If that happened to you, and let's say you had been, you know, what if that house had not had a phone? Um, Does that make you think that this has happened to other women, to other girls that were there? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You better believe it. Yes, absolutely. And I think... I really wish you could talk to Virginia at some point. Uh, I've tried to reach out to her because she follows me on Twitter, but I don't have her email. So if you would be willing to connect us. Okay, I'm going to connect you too. I'm going to connect you. Yeah. Oh, you better believe it. There's another kid, um, just to help him out, there's this kid, Bobby Capucci, that's like not benefiting at all from this. And he, I just wanted you to follow him or help him get some follows because he's like uh, really dedicated. I'll tell you the story. His girlfriend had really severe cancer last year, and she was so bothered by this. She had stage four breast cancer. She had to get her, a W, you know, like everything done. She had a double mastectomy. She had chemo radiation, and she was following this case while it was happening. And she and he was working really hard, supporting getting her through the cancer. And she said, I want you to promise me something, Bobby. When I get through this, I'm going to survive. You're going to support these women. I mean, these are like kind of superheroes, this couple. They live in Nevada, and they're super young. And he said... He said, okay, I'll do it. And he started researching it. He had been like in finance, right? And he was a sportscaster and he's like, all right, I'll do it. And so then she, because he got such a great voice and he's so energetic. And so he's been doing this now for like uh, eight months, I think. Every, twice a day he's doing these podcasts. And, they, and it really calls out like Wexner and he's going to do one on Randy, but he, he calls out everybody constantly. So anyway, I hooked Virginia up with him and so she's been able to give him a lot of information which has been really great because we can filter it to people we just aren't allowed to say it you know we're not allowed to talk but yeah I would love for you to talk to her because she experienced the abuse side more and I experienced like the clerical kind of weird like observing side you know more mm-hmm. right that makes any sense so yeah. so how do i um, how do i what your information you're telling me then i can't i can't connect it to you i can just say i mean what, what oh no you can connect everything to me okay oh absolutely absolutely yeah okay yeah. i just wanted to have that clear i just I don't, meant I don't i'm not going to go on and publicly uh, okay. do, you don't want to be the person putting the i just don't want to have my own there, podcast you. or yeah, something yeah yeah i got you okay yeah no that makes yeah. sense i just some people yeah because of First legal of all, reasons no aren't technically allowed to talk to reporters you know what i mean so i wanted to make sure that wasn't the yeah the case yeah. here mm-hmm. right right no no thank you for that no i'm allowed to talk um yep okay so another reason another thing i want to tell you is that brain tumor so when they checked it they stuck like this little, after radiation and everything, they were checking it, and they stuck this little thing down my nose, and it goes in, and, and they, they touched this one spot, and it was my vocal cords, and they were like, you were two weeks away from permanently losing your voice. And I oh, freaked out, no. and I'm like, David, I'm going to file that affidavit. Like, that's why I did the affidavit, too. I was like, what? I have, I'm, I mean, the silence is so suffocating that I've experienced in this case, you know? And there's nothing worse than reporting what happened to the actual enemy. Like the FBI was the worst enemy of all. So I'm going to tell you the last thing they did. So my sister and I, so they, they don't offer us witness protection. They want us to testify, expect us to, of course, order us to. Then we go to New York now, but last year for 2020. I don't want to do it. I'm like, oh, God, but I'm good friends with Jim Hill. He's been working on this for seven years, trying to get my FBI reports, and he's the producer of 2020, and they've refused, of course, to give him anything. So they finally send a redacted version of the second report, and I'm able to unredact the whole thing because guess what? I have a photographic memory, so I'm able to go through, and I unredact it, and I'm like, well, this is what it says, and Jim's like, wow, Maria, that's pretty crazy, and then... It, and, and, and everything in it, he was able to fact check, and it was all true, and it was just weird. So then we go to New York, and guess what? Annie's there. Annie has had, I'm not belittling her experience at all, but she's had very little contact with them, like very little. The, it was horrifying contact, but it was just brief, right? She saw nothing. She was never around any other women. She just knows her story of what happened. 
They ask her in. The FBI interviews her. I've driven from Conceit with Jim Hill, the producer of 2020, drives me from Paducah, Kentucky, all the way to New York City. And the FBI does not bother to ask for me for an interview. They just interview Annie. She flew there. Flew. Home. I've driven there. It's their opportunity to talk to me. They are absolutely blatantly not wanting to know anything. And they keep talking to girls who just, you know, that were raped, but don't, were basically blindfolded on the way in and on the way out. And I'm like, but I understand the inner working and the people involved. I understand that when Bill Clinton was coming, this is the craziest. When Bill Clinton would come, Ghislaine would get in a tizzy. She's like, the president's coming, the president's coming. And there is a guy, with, he's the holy grail to this case, Whitney. And his name, he was the chef. His name is Chef Andy, and I don't know his last name, but we found him. Um, David Boy's firm found him. And he is in Chicago working for some spice company. And this guy is the biggest scumbag in the world. And he was... I believe Wexner's chef first on his yacht because that's what he told me. And then of course he was given to Jeffrey and Gilan and he could cook like, I mean, he's a mad chef, but he was the biggest creep. I mean, the biggest creep. And he lived in this building on 66th street and like all the models and all the people, they, they had all the Victoria's secret models living there. They said, but it ended up, those were girls from Europe. And this was in the early nineties living in that building. It was full of people for Epstein. Was this before And I know because she had me go in and decorate or, all... Sorry, um, was this before 1995? This is in 1995. Oh, okay, yeah. This is during... This is in 95. Okay. That building was full of women from, like, Eastern Europe. Um, and I didn't know why. You know, I thought they were Victoria's Secret models, of course. And, I mean, full of victims, okay? And I know because I went in and decorated all of their apartments. Jeffrey and Gieland hired me to decorate them. And so I went in and decorated. Like, I saw a lot, you know? But Andy lived there, and I went, the last time I ever saw him, I slapped him. I went to say, why did you not tell me what was going on? And he said, you knew, because everybody knew. And I slapped him, of course, my sister got hurt, right? And I, I could have been arrested, I guess, nowadays, but I slapped his face. And I left, and I wish I hadn't. I wish I'd said, can I get all your information? and where you're going to live, and because this guy saw it all. So he was the only one who was allowed to ever be there when the president was coming. Okay, when, when, And this happened when I was there three times in one year at that house that Bill freaking Clinton came, and we all had to leave except two Filipino maids and Chef Andy, and that's it. And everyone else had to clear out. And I mean, clear out. And I would be the last to go. And Gilan was running around. And Andy, everybody was, like, decorating to the hilt and getting, you know, candies laid out and foods. And everything was spectacular. And that happened three times when I worked there. And no one ever believed me because there was no security detail. There was no announcement that the president was coming. But he was going to that house with children. <laughs> you better believe it. And Gilan would say, Oh, we've got to get lots of girls today. The president's coming. And I told the FBI all of this. And he was the sitting president. And they knew I was telling the truth. I could tell that they knew. And they, did, they, they thought it was just great. They just wanted to feed more children to him, I guess. It's just, like, unbelievable. But that guy, if you could interview Chef Andy, if you could get through to him, Whitney, you would have the holy grail of this whole thing. He had been with them for 10 years. He'd have to talk to me. So he knows all the <laughs> early contact He knows all is, about what. half the battle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I have to try and convince them to, to talk to me too. So it's a little. I'm trying to get my lawyers to subpoena him. Wow. Well, if that happens. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Yeah. But but my lawyers are going to be subpoenaing him very soon. Yeah. We're, we're going to get information out of Andy. Trust me. Um He's not aged well. Like he's li The other thing I've noticed about all these people is Satan starting to show. I hate to be like, you know, weird about it, but it's true. Like with all of them, they have aged so poorly. And I don't mean just aesthetically, but like they've become like decrepit souls. You can see it, Whitney. I, I've looked up some of the symbolism from I saw around the house, and it's satanic symbolism. It, you, it is. I don't know if example? Jeffrey knew. I know Ghislaine knows. I'm sure she does. So he had like, um, yeah, 
he had like this thing and it ends up it's like Baphomet, but it was like uh, like a symbol of this. And I looked, I actually sent it to a friend of mine. I was like, what? Because I recognized it from something I'd seen at Jeffrey's. And they were like, oh, that's a symbol of Satan. I'm like, what? Okay. So, um, yeah, I just remember seeing, like, uh, in his place, he had this, and I don't know if it was Wexner did it first, but they would engrave things into the limestone, right? And so it's engraved in his place in, uh, in New Mexico as well, uh, these symbols. And they're satanic symbols. So I'll have to I'll have to go through and send you you know images of what I'm talking about, um, but there's there's more to this is all I'm saying. But the other thing that's really weird is when that case happened two days ago when it was you know the crap happened where they're deciding against us. Especially it's especially hurtful you know to Brad and Courtney. Um, I uh, I heard one of the judges say. Stop that. That's the reptile's lament. She's like awake. She knows. <laughs> I'm like, how did she? She didn't say that by chance. She's the one who's going to make sure it goes to the Supreme Court. That woman on the, I don't know what her so name you, is. But so you she's think that ruling is going to be, dissent. you think it's going to be and appealed? This, this yeah, ruling. ruling. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Brad, and Stan, Brad and Stan are working on it right now. We are absolutely taking it to the Supreme Court. Absolutely. Yeah, Brad, but Brad and I don't Stan know. The Supreme Court like is full of right now. unfortunate judges I know. <laughs> that are all pretty compromised, but at least they'll keep it going, you know? Well, we have a... Wait, I didn't hear that part? Oh, no, but at least it'll... You'll, you'll keep the case going until Wait, it, it cut gets out there. a second. Oh, sorry. Um, I can switch to Wi-Fi really quick. Um, I'm on my phone. Sometimes the signal isn't as good. Okay. If you just want to... Can you can you hear me now, or is it still bad? Oh no, that's okay. I don't want you to spend money on Wi-Fi. I was just no, gonna, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's expensive. It's not. Yeah, a big I can deal. hear you. I've okay. heard you the whole time. It just, just, it just cut out. It just cut out for the Supreme Court part, and I wanted to hear what you said. Oh, um, no, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you'll be keeping the case going, um, because the way it sounded when it was reported made it sound yes. like it couldn't be appealed. I guess, but anyway, um, it's good to know. That's that right. I know. Mm -hmm. But it, it will. It will be appealed. Yeah, they're repealing it right now. And and Courtney is such a superhero. I mean, this girl is so, she's, again, brilliant. And here's what kills me about all of us. is like, I had just earned my master's degree. You know, I was, I was on this great trajectory. I was studying with Chuck Close and Eric Fischel. I was not a normal artist. Like, I was really selling my work out of my studio for 20 grand a pop. And I was making a lot of money. And I was going to do really well. And then these people sideline me and say, well, you have to have money, though, every day. And, you know, and they knew that I was successful. And, and, and they, they destroyed me on purpose, Whitney. They destroyed all of us on purpose. Um, Jeffrey would have kept me just like as a court painter slave, you know, I think. But Ghislaine would have definitely just had me off. And I just, I just knew it. I mean, and if they were going to kill me so easily, and I was an adult... How easily do they kill children? You know, that's, that's always been my thing. Like, how many children has Randy Bowie murdered? I'll guarantee you that guy with his giant hands could strangle children very easily and have no moral compunc compunction about it. This guy has no morals. And I know that's not factual morals or whatever, but I'm telling you, when you're around these people, there is something completely off and different about this one group to the point where I was actually glad I was in hiding in obscure hillbilly town. Like I've had to live in horrible places full of ignorant hillbillies and it was a relief because they weren't elites, you know? Yeah. It was just, it's, and for a long time I had a hard time with like all Jewish people. I'm going to be honest with you. For a long time I was like, I think it's all the Jews. Like, I don't know because <laughs> my sister's like, Maria, it's just the one you met. It's these people. It's just unfortunate that all the Jewish people I met also happen to be pedophiles that one, r run the world economy, you know? <laughs> so it gives you, like, a bad taste in your mouth. But David Icke has kind of helped me with that. I kind of understand it better now, but I'm like, oh, that was hard. You know, they did a number on all of us. We've all had a hard time with, like, a lot of it because of 
the abuse, you know? So it's hard to not then go, all these people are like this, when it's not true. Not all of them. Just a huge chunk of elites are like this. I guess all of the elites. I don't know. But I know that they're all in on it together, and I know that they all knew Whitney. And the other thing that's really weird about, you know, Eileen Guggenheim, last time I saw her, I was leaving her, I I went to go see her daughter because I raised her freaking daughter and lived in their house as an au pair. And this woman had so little respect for me after I treated her daughter so well. And so anyway, I go to, you know, ask me why my sister was murdered, that she must have done something wrong. What did I do wrong? And I remember, um, anyway, going to see Isabel Guggenheim that day. And by the way, they're not real Guggenheims. That was a name that they usurped to make themselves big in the art world. But they're just any old Guggenheim out of the phone book. They're not the art family. But they use that to make it seem like they are so that they can get all these connections. So the whole thing is a scam. So she she scammed her way through life, this woman. And I go to Lee after seeing Isabel. We've had a nice little visit. She had just gotten into Princeton, and I was, like, really proud of her, right? Or, no, she'd just gotten into high school. That's what it was. And I was really proud of her because she got into a great high school. And I'm leaving, and I see this shiny thing on the counter. And for some reason, I walk over and look at it, and it's a gil- gilded invitation from Ghislaine Maxwell, and it's to, for Eileen to the royal family for some benefit function in England. And I looked at her and I said, are you kidding me? And she said, no, I'm not kidding you. And I left. And I never spoke to her again. And I had been, you know, this had been a woman that was like a major part of I could not believe it. I was devastated that she was, after knowing that I had been hurt so badly and I was a student at the school, that she was with them for the money. So then I find out the next week that Ghislaine got Eileen a job as the press secretary for Prince Charles in the United States. Now, here's the other thing. I met those royals, all of them, except the queen. You know, I didn't meet her, and I didn't meet, like, the children. But I met Prince Charles. I met Andrew. I met all those people at the Academy. They were always coming to the New York Academy of Art. There is a problem. Then, okay, and I'm going to back up. Whitney, I have so much information. I'm so sorry. No, but when no, I was that's in why France, I set aside in the afternoon. School, all the information, in the, however you want to tell me, jump around all you want. Thank you. You know, it, I, it's my job to organize yeah. the info. It just, it just <laughs> you know what I mean? Me. So, you know, okay, thank you. <laughs> you don't have to worry about thank you, that. But, that's what I do. But when I was in, <laughs> thank you. When I was in France in 1991, 1991, I was in art school at the Lacoste School of the Arts in the south of France. It was just such a privilege, and it was the most incredible experience, right? And I'm there, and I'm like, wow, this is great. Here I am in art school. This is wonderful. And I see this sign that says, and it's, I remember it so well because my friend Red, Randy Mellick drew it, but I didn't know at the time. I didn't know Randy yet. And I see this sign, and it's elongated, and it's a figure like the one Eileen, I mean, that uh, Yilan stole from me. Um, it's a figurative drawing in the red pencil like that. And I was like, oh, I've always wanted to draw like that. And I want to learn anatomy that way. And my roommate, who is German now, she's never been to America. She was German. She said, Marie, you can't go to that school. And I said, why? And she said, they have a pedophile ring. They're running out of that school. Whitney, this was 1992. She was talking about the New York Academy of Art. My German roommate in France knew about it. Wow. Is that not weird? And I ignored her because I thought, man, she's kind of, maybe Germans are weird. (laughs) You know, I was like, are all German people weird? (laughs) She's really weird. You know, I thought I'd never even heard the word pedophile. And anyone who used that word, I kind of felt sorry for them. I was like, well, that's a weird thing to think about. You know, I mean, here I am so young, no clue. I'm at a little like Christian school in California, a Catholic school in California, like had no idea that this stuff existed, even though it goes on in the Catholic church. I had never seen it. And so when she said that, I thought, that is so, so I remembered after this happened to me, I was like, holy smoke, how did she know that? And of course, I'm not in touch with her anymore, but that was weird. So Randy Mellick had that school, he's somebody you might want to talk to. Randy Mellick was a professor at that, that school, and he made sure it was matriculated um, because he went to the school. And he said, I would really like, you know, so he helped Eileen make it a matriculated school, but he wasn't happy with the way she was running things. Like, she would use the students to clean her house. 
She would use the students to babysit her kid. She would use the students to pimp. I'll bet you anything Randy Mellick would know. There's another girl that would know. Um, her name is Ursula Rudenberg. R-U-D-E-N-B-U-R-G or B-E-R-G. Ursula. And she was older. So she was able to like see more of what was going on. And actually, she contacted Artnet and came to my defense and said, Eileen Guggen, I'm lying. Because she brought us to that estate out in North Carolina, I mean in, uh, sorry, in um, New Mexico. And she, not only did she bring us there actively, she told us to flirt with Jeffrey. And she played a game, a really creative game, where we had to pull falsies out of a bag. I didn't remember any of this, Whitney. But this woman, I guess because of age, like, she was able to remember it. And I only remembered it after hearing it. I was like, oh my God, that's right. That did happen. And Eileen had told me to go sit on his lap, and I wouldn't. This was the first time I was around Jeffrey, other than when he stole my art, basically, the first time, when Eileen introduced me to them and said, I had already sold the painting. And she goes, no, 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 no. You're going to go hand that check back to that. This was a German man that bought it. Go hand that back. Uh, Jeffrey's going to buy it, but you're going to have to sell it for half price because he wants a discount. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. And she said, you're doing that for the Academy. Do you understand me? He's important for the Academy. Do you hear me? You do it right now. This is how they spoke to me, and I did it. And this is how Eileen, this is how the elite speak to their, quote, servants. They're, they're I don't know, just like the regular people who aren't Jewish that are allowed to eat at the country club. Aren't allowed to eat at the country club, sorry. It's a big part of it. It's a problem. <laughs> they're, they're, oh, she told my sister she couldn't go to Penn. And she wanted Annie to go to this school. Uh, I can't remember what school. It's uh, a very good school, but I can't remember the name of it. And Annie wanted to go to Penn. Our grandfather founded it. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He founded the medical school there, and she wanted to go there. And Eileen said, you can't go to that school. And when we asked why, she said, black people live in Philadelphia. Oh my They're gosh. completely rich. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that Yeah, I mean, all. like, to a point where you wouldn't believe yeah, you wouldn't believe the way Jeffrey and Gillan spoke about African Americans. It was like, it made my skin crawl. Anybody who was not Jewish, and you can write about this, but the way they spoke about them, it was really horrifying. And it showed me a great deal about how these tr people truly believe that they're chosen to do something here. I don't know. It's unbelievable to me. I mean, and it was every one of them, the way they spoke. And one time I heard I, Isabel say to her mother, Eileen, Mommy, why do you call Maria a nobody? And she said, Honey, Isabel, Maria is not a Jew. She is a nobody. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, it, it is worth pointing. So you pointing, can see I why mean, for about well, 20 that, years. Well, that type of stuff I might actually include just because um, – the Maxwell family have you tied to this it. group you that's, um, it. what's it called, Chabad Lubavitch, and um, they that um, oh, group God. openly talks about um, how only Jews are human and the rest of human beings are like yeah. cattle, basically. So, yeah. I mean, it'll well, probably this is end another up being thing part Eileen, of the story. Uh, Gilan said. Good. Well, Gilan did make it very clear to me that Annie was very lucky to be able to carry a Jewish baby. That was another thing. She said she would have been so lucky. See, they constantly made it very clear to me. You can't eat at the country club because you're not a Jew. You can't. And, and I mean, it people takes people's, it's like they get hit with a soccer ball in the gut. I've told every news network. And they go, oh, we can't talk about that. Of course, you can't talk about the truth, right? You can, but most people just won't. And I think it's a huge part of it because this is a problem this elitism is very deep, and these are the people pushing racism. These are the people saying, pushing white, they're saying there, there's white supremacy, which maybe there is in some ignorant southern hillbilly groups, but I don't know any white supremacists, <laughs> but I know a lot of Jewish supremacists. They're all elites, and they're all connected, and they're all in a big group, and they are the biggest supremacists I've ever met. And the things they said about black people made me cry, honest to God. It made me sick. I was like, I can't, and they and they 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 make it very clear. They made it very clear that I, I was a servant because I was white. I was a white servant. Yeah, it was made very clear to me. No, no, no. You're just a servant. You're white. Another thing I I wanted to tell you is when I first got the job with Epstein, 
that, you know, the, the night, the day following when I had to walk home from Barbara Guggenheim's and Epstein called me. He asked me to meet him in his office the next morning. So the first morning I went in there, I'll never forget. He had all these, it looked like a real office, right? You walk in and there are all these people like secretaries working, answering phones, all this stuff. And Katie Ford and Andre Velotz were in there. Okay. Katie Ford, if you look back at her, boy, that's one, that's a son of a bitch, that woman. She's a real son of a bitch. And nobody has called her out. No one. That woman is why they were able to pretend that they were hiring these models. They used her as a cover. And her mother was partners with that guy that they then partnered with in Europe to start X21 or whatever that group is, that modeling agency, XM. Yeah, Brunel. Katie Ford's mother was partnered with Brunel. And Katie was very connected to him. And Eileen Guggenheim said to, I mean, Gilan said to me, um, would you like, I, I, I think Annie should model, and we'll, we'll just have her model through Katie here. And I was like, Annie doesn't want to model. She wants to go to an Ivy League. She's not interested. Thank you. She's like, oh, well, then she can work for, uh, then, uh, then I'll call my friend Harvey. She was talking about Harvey Weinstein. She goes, he can, she can just work in, um, she can work in Hollywood. I'm like, you're not listening to me. She's an academic. <laughs> She's going to write. She wants to be a doctor. She's not interested. They didn't get it. You know what I mean? So I walk into the office, and I sit down, and behind him, I swear to God, this is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, Whitney. I'm sitting there talking, and Jeffrey's got this smile from ear to ear, and he's in sweats. And sitting behind him on the radiator in the Helmsley Palace Hotel office, Morgan Fairchild. And she looks like a tiny plastic doll. And she's just sitting there, never says a word, just smiling. And I'm like, is this not slanting? Or like, I'm trying to figure out what movie she was in. <laughs> and I'm like, what's happening? You know, what's happening? And why is this woman observing? And every time I went to her office, he was, every time I went to his office, she was seated there. No one talks about this. But she was there all the time. She was part of his group. She was a groupie or something. I don't know. But she knew very well that he was procuring. There's no way she didn't know because she was in his office. And she knew. I mean, she knew, you know. And I guarantee you, you can look up Morgan Fairchild and contact her and ask her what the hell she was doing with him. Because she was very much a part of that. Early 90s, she'd been friends with him for a long time. And when I asked Gilan about it, Gilan said, oh, Jeffrey thinks that Morgan Fairchild is the perfect woman. And I'm like, but he doesn't even, <laughs> now I'm thinking about it, he doesn't even like women, you know, but whatever. So that's weird, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, just so many of these and sick people Andre are just Ballot. so, Andre so Ballot. obsessed with raw ambition that, like, they will just look the other way with these people abusing kids, you know? It's, like, just sad. Oh, it's so sick. It's so unforgiving. Yeah. And, and Andre Balot, I want him called out. That motherfucker, let me tell you, sorry, that guy, I hate him. He really makes me mad because he has W hotels. And he then went on to marry, like, Uma Thurman. I don't know if they're still married or what, but I remember following in the 90s and feeling sick. Like, I'd go to the grocery, and I'd see all these people I knew on the store thing, and I'd be like, oh, I feel sick. My mom's like, don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. You know, we'd walk by aisles with, like, magazines or, you know. It's horrible. I mean, it's just been horrible, Whitney. I've tried to erase them, and that doesn't work. You have to face it. But it's weird because I did try to call them out. And Vanity Fair made sure that all the girls were always afraid then to ever come forward. And that was 100% Vanity Fair. That was 100% Vicki Ward. And I know Graydon Carter's life was threatened by Jeffrey, but what is Vicki's excuse? She was the one who took the case. I mean, she was the one who prom she gave me her word. And then she turned her back on us and wrote the best article about him and then said, she wrote an article, <laughs> if you listen to the focal flick, I'll send it to you, but there's, you know, that guy from NPR, he did a case, he did a story on this called the cat head and the bullet and the farmer sisters, something like that. And it's um, Dan Folkelflick. And in it, he refers to the fact that Vicki Ward writes an article. He starts hanging out with Ghislaine then after knowing what Ghislaine did to me, after everything I told her that Ghislaine was doing to children. 
she starts hanging out with her and says that money makes up for all the wrongdoings in New York society. It's a quote from her article. Wow. Yeah. That's and so then um, Vicki Ward contacts David Boys and says, what did I ever do to you? She, like, chews out David Boys and, yeah. I mean, she's a nightmare. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> She'll, the Vicky, uh, I call her, I'm just going to tell you, I call her a prostitute. And I said, you are a prostitute? She, first of all, she contacts me privately after we'd asked her not to many times. All the lawyers had asked her not to, per, you know, in person. Just said, please don't bother the farmers anymore. They just don't want to be bothered. Their mom's having a hard time because Maria's really sick. So what does she do? She hounds my mother all the time. So then she contacts me and she says, you know what? I don't even need to talk to you because I'm a victim of Epstein just as much as you are. What? Can you believe it? She's victimizing victims. She said, because when I was pregnant, now here's the thing. When you have twins, it's a high-risk pregnancy. She likes to say her, her pregnancy was high-risk because she was trying to write this article to help expose him during that time. And so he, he harassed her, and she had to have bodyguards at her thing. Maybe that all happened. That is all her doing. And guess what, Vicki? You didn't even do it in the end. All you did was become friends with them. She became their friend. She was friends with Epstein. I mean, it's unbelievable. <laughs> so, yeah, you can't make it up. You cannot make up the levels of abuse that we've all endured. And the way that it's, I'll tell you, the only person who's been respectable to me is Anthony Mason from CBS. He's the only one. I mean, you know, I'm friends with Jim Hill because I've, we worked together for seven years. But And, like, I know him in a way you don't even know someone unless you've, like, dorm, been in their dorm, you know, because we had to ride together across country. And then they drove me back to Arkansas. I mean, it was, like, thousands of hours with these people. But this guy, Anthony Mason, he actually, he's actually kind of, um, like, a really good person. And he really cares about human beings. And so he did a really honest report. He was the first one. Nobody would break the story. And so finally Anthony's like, fine, I'll do it. And he did. And he flew here and did an interview because I really wanted people to know how much we were all suffering. And nobody would report on it. 